mean by extracting structure from data? Let's look at some examples. I'm glad somebody started the recording. Thank you. Um, because a few weeks ago, I, I forgot to notice that, and I forgot this time too. <laughs> so we, we are missing one of the recordings, so thank you for that. All right, so uh, here is an example of so-called supervised learning. I, I just made this example up. Um, it's not one of the classic examples. It isn't one of the classic examples, um, but it um, it is an example that's relevant to the kinds of things we do at Harper Adams. Uh, so maybe for this example, may, maybe maybe the goal here is we're trying to find a way. May, maybe it's like the new farm subsidies package, ELM, that the government is trying on. You know, I, I, I think there's an idea to do something like what I have pictured here. Um, maybe there's something to to categorize some kinds of farming practice as um, as poor and some kinds of farming practice as good. OK, m and maybe this is a very crude view of this, but maybe this is um, maybe this is uh, exactly what we're doing with uh, the the whatever the shape of farming management and regulation of farming and um, compensating farmers fairly for what they provide to us. So for this um, kind of system, there are all sorts of data that are relevant to this and, and they broadly encompass things like all of the aspects of farming inputs, all of the aspect of farming systems, all of the geographic and spatially relevant um, aspects and then maybe also data on um, aspects of environmental impacts like measures of biodiversity all taxa this is by um, taxa in the soil this is uh, organisms that fly and use land adjacent to farms directly on farms and probably lots of other data too now we're we're just going to ignore the burden here of uh, how to get all of this data and to organize it all so that we could use it for this task. That is probably the biggest challenge for this specific task, but we're going to ignore that and pretend that we just have a big old data set with all this, all these um, features in it. I've just, I've just used this term features and we'll come back to it in a second. It's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of jargon that is a little bit different from traditional statistics, but features of data here just mean all of the data that we collect that uh, will help us make a decision and then um, now there are lots of different kinds of machine learning models so we're just going to use a generic one we'll, we'll use regression as our machine learning model later um, and then the machine learning model based on all of this data we've input to it will will for a, a new example that we um, challenge it with will help us make the decision and classify um, whether a farm practice uh, farm is practicing um, um, poor standards or good standards. Okay, so this is supervised learning where like we know the categories. I'm just gonna just close my um, outlook so it doesn't make that huge noise again. Okay. Now, an example of, of unsupervised learning would be, well, maybe we've collected data and the data are represented by these. Um, it's a pretty poor graph, isn't it? I'm sorry about that. They're not labeled the axes, for example, but you can see they're on a scale from negative three to positive three, both the X and the Y. And maybe in this case, it represents um, something we've talked about before in, um, the uh, R club meetings, most of you have come to most of those. And uh, maybe it's a principal components analysis. We've got loads and loads of numeric variables and we've crunched all the variation for those variables down into, into um, some smaller number of axes that we can, we can uh, rank the axes in terms of how much variation they contain. And the, the reason we use PCA is that by definition, the first 
couple of axes might explain almost all the variation. So we hope that's true here and that the, these axes represent, say, principal component one, principal component two from some much larger number of variables. And here, what we might want to know is, well, um, in, in the previous example, we knew that we wanted to classify farms into poor and good, and maybe we had a data and a starting data set where some farms were evaluated and adjudicated and classified as poor or good by humans, and we used that model to train a machine learning model to classify new farms as poor or good automatically. Here is different. Here, we're not saying poor or good. Maybe, maybe we're, we don't even know. Maybe there are more than two categories. The suggestion on the color groupings here is that there are three categories of, of farms that fall out from an analysis of these principal components. And here we've just asked, are there any groups? We asked the machine to say, are there any groupings of data that uh, have values that are that are close to each other, and if they are, how many are there? And uh, with this kind of model, we could compare the fit of models between um, between um, you know two or or three or four or five or or just one, and maybe we we then could do another evaluation of saying, well, which which one of those numbers of groupings fit the data the best? So this is unsupervised learning where we don't know the categories. We wouldn't use, we would use all sorts of different tools. So this is just sort of peeking into a much bigger toolbox today. Um, we wouldn't use linear regression for this. We might um, use something like k-means. It's a, it's a clustering algorithm. Okay, so here are the high level steps of uh, any kind of supervised, we're going to focus on supervised learning. It's probably the most, uh, I think it's safe to say it is the most popular flavor of machine learning. And it it's just really changed the way that that um, almost every industry, I, I might even go as, to far, as far to say as it has changed how every industry works. And, and it's changed it over a very short time period. If I really go back to the dawn of time for the what has been happening with machine learning, I might go back as far as as uh, around 20 years, but but actually the rate of change has been massively increasing every year. The rate has been increasing every year, and I, I, if you if you look 20 years ago and you waited 10 years, there would have been a big impact and a big change. But if you look five years ago and compare it to now, it's night and day. Every, every industry is using supervised learning now. And if they're not, they've hired somebody to start doing it as fast as they can so they don't get left in the dust. This goes for agriculture. This goes for any scientific discipline as well. It goes for how universities operate. It goes for how companies hire people. Every, every industry is using this and will use it a lot more in the, in the future. For people like yourselves, that's great. Because uh, if you're aware of these tools, you'll be positioned to understand what's going on. And companies, every industry uh, are paying a premium for this kind of uh, knowledge and, and skill set right now. OK, enough of that. I'll try to stop um, being so excited about data science and machine learning and just get on with it. So. Um, these are the main steps of supervised learning. I'll, I'll just say the words here and then I have a picture that we can look at and spend a little more time on in the next one. Next slide. So first, um, one step might be to, uh, to uh, choose a model framework. So you would, you would so the jargon here is that we would train a model in some machine learning modeling framework like like linear regression and we would initially train it with what we would call labeled data this is data like if we if we use jargon like a scientist would use we would have a, one data set with a dependent variable and explanatory variables it, it it we use different terminology in data science and in machine learning um, but we call this set of data our labeled data 
uh, or our training data set. And uh, the machine learning model part is meant to describe and uh, to, to learn the relationship between the variables that are the independent variables, the explanatory variables, and that dependent variable. Now, again, a little bit of jargon. Um, for our dependent variable, we call the, um, we, we typically in machine learning call the variables or the independent variables, we call them the attributes or features of our training data set. Uh, and then the second step is we make predictions on new data. So uh, for science, this is again, it's a massive departure from what we typically do as scientists. When, when uh, you're, you're doing a scientific project, you collect your data, you, you design your experiment, you figure out how much data you need to collect, you collect it all, then you analyze it, boom, that's it. All you have to do is then write the paper and uh, communicate it to the world. But that's just the beginning for a machine learning model. Once we, once we make our initial machine learning model with our training data set, then the fun starts, then we use it. We leverage that machine learning model to make new predictions. That's the value in machine learning. Let's look at a diagram of that. So th this is a schematic. Um, this upper part of this diagram is the, um, is the training part of the diagram. So the data incoming might be um, text. It might be free text. It might be documents. It might be images. It might be things you measure. Um, and there might be quite a lot of them, and they might be very different from one another. Um, we also then have uh, what we call labels. If it's a if it's a categorization problem for machine learning, like uh, like looking in images and uh, deciding whether it's a a beach ball, a cat, a human face, a car, or maybe what digit occur, um, occurs on a on a registration plate on a vehicle, um, or if it's a uh, numerical problem, it may be then the, the values for the dependent variable. Um, well, for, for the uh, explanatory raw data, we convert those into um, vectors of features or, or vectors, columns of variables. They're exactly the same thing. They work exactly the same way. There's no magic here. But it is the case that regular old statisticians and scientists use that one set of inferential um, jargon, and data scientists these days have invented completely different language to describe exactly the same thing. And what you do is you uh, uh, traditionally, and by traditionally, I mean, you know, over this very short period of time, you feed in the explanatory features and in the uh, labels or the um, dependent variable into some machine learning algorithm, okay, like a regression model. And then from that, you get the predictive model. Now, this is very simplified. Sometimes if it's a complicated machine learning model, there's quite a lot to this, to this circle here that says machine learning algorithm. There can be a lot going on there. Um, in fact, we'll go through a few steps today, even with a simple regression, to figure out what exactly is the best algorithm to describe our data set. Even with a really simple data set, there, there's usually a little bit of um, subjectivity and uh, experimentation here. And, and coming up with the best machine learning algorithm, to me, is one of the fun parts um, of doing data science, because um, you can be creative and you really you're really uh, creating um, something new. That's a great question, Samu. Um, how do uh, the feature vectors differ from the raw data? Well, um, for a simple problem, like for a regression, they probably don't differ at all. They're probably identical to the raw data. But for other kinds of problems, like uh, computer vision problems, where your, your input data are, um, say, picture files, or um, or PDFs or web pages. Um, what happens is you go through a data. Um, the the re this this is sort of a high level schematic to cover all situations. And for those situations where you have pictures or text, 
um, you first have to convert the information contained in those pictures or the text into some kind of features that could be analyzed. And let me just give you a little bit of an example to solidify that so it isn't so vague. I know it might be vague, but um, so it's beyond the scope of what we can do in a short meeting to cover all the things. But what if you wanted to analyze, um, um, say, bird song, uh, and you, you were going to record um, birds out in the environment and you wanted to identify them to what as to what species they were well your your documents that would go into creating the feature vectors for in that case would be sound files and you might impose some analysis on the sound files that went in in order to identify one to identify the chunks where there are sound and separate those from chunks that are where there is quiet and then second, you, for the ones where there's sound, maybe one of the features might be how much energy, you know, how loud the sound is. And maybe another feature might be something about um, the frequency of the sound. Yet another one might be to classify bits of the sound into syllables. And those syllables, the energy measurement and the duration of sound to silence would be the features. So uh, that, that's all it means. Uh, there may be a little processing of the raw data to turn it into features that you can analyze. That's, that's quite an involved thing too. But if it's just regression, the, the raw data you collect and the feature columns, they're exactly the same. So there's, there's a lot going on up here potentially for depending on your problem. Um, okay, so Let's assume that a lot of stuff has gone on up here and you you've um, you have uh, created this data, you've chucked it into a model, you've rolled that model around um, amongst all the possibilities and you've picked the best model and let's call that best model the predictive model. Then the, the way that this has value in the machine learning world is that you take your new data, so you, you've trained a model to identify the species of bird, or a label in that bird example would be what the species is, which bird is it? And then the second part down here is that you take a new, uh, a new web page, a new PDF, a new uh, picture, a new picture of a license, um, a registration on a car, going into a car park, wanting to park for free. You don't want those hospital workers in the NHS having parking for free. You want to make sure you get their registration so you can charge them the money they owe the government. Just joking about that. I hope you guys get that. But uh, it might be that recording of a bird that you've taken and you want to, say, analyze biodiversity on hedges on a farm margin or uh, something like that, and you feed that uh, that that raw data into the pipeline that extracts the feature vectors from it, and then you feed the features into your predictive model, and in out of your predictive model comes, well, maybe what bird it is. So that that is really a very very high level view of how it all works, and it's the main difference between. Um, between if I were to draw this for statistics, none of this bottom part would be there. And instead of machine learning algorithm up here, there would be um, the statistical results that you would report in a paper or chapter um, or report. So uh, it, we use it in a fundamentally, fundamentally different way than traditional statistics. All right, so the... Um, so a way of saying this is that the primary goal of supervised learning is to build a model that that generalizes um, that generalizes the uh, the data, and the the goal is accurately to predict future things, future data, future classifications, future numerical predictions if it's regression, rather than describing what happened in a past experiment. With a past experiment, I, I have to say. 
the gambit that scientists make is they're they want to make an inference on the global you know broader population but they don't you know it's not in our toolbox at least not yet it's not in our toolbox as scientists at least not yet to um to actually challenge the model that we produce the statistical model we produce from analyzing an experiment with new data that we collect we collect our our data in the past so that's a fundamental difference another way of saying it <clears throat> there are all sorts of questions with machine learning and i, I don't mean these to be uh, i don't i want to um, make sure that you don't think i'm putting these up as as problems uh, these questions are the good kinds of questions, the questions that you do work to answer. And, and you know, if you're like me, it's a it's pure joy to ask these questions and then to figure out how to get the answers. So, um, you know, one of the questions with machine learning is, um, well, you know, how do you pick which data that you feed in to include in your model. How do you pick those attributes? If you're starting with pictures, with photographs, um, it, uh, it there can be many, many <laughs> attributes. And uh, it's another thing, I, Joe, I see you, Joseph, I see you sitting there uh, in this chat and I, I can't help but to think of all those conversations you and I had, all the, all the writing you did and all the kind of arguing that you and I um, and I mean collegiate arguing, you know, debating and discussing that we had over how best to capture attributes of those potato plant stems. Um, so just picking which attributes that you convert into features from raw data, uh, it, it's fun, you know, but it is a task. It's one of the questions we ask. Um, how do you choose which model? Well, um, there's two layers to this. One is the broad machine learning approach, regression versus, um, you know, other things. But uh, there's a second layer. Once you pick the specific framework, um, there could be lots of debate over um, how to parameterize it and tweak it so that it's optimized to make accurate predictions. So um, two layers to the which model to use question. How do you optimize the model for best performance? Well, we, we will actually even today, I'll show you three of the, the measures we use um, to do it. This is another way that um, traditional statistics um, differ from, um, from uh, machine learning and data science is uh, with, with um, scientists analyzing data. Uh, we tend to optimize our model uh, by looking at the p-value, you know, initially. So we, we evaluate uh, whether a model is good or not based on whether it is statistically significant. We use a completely different mindset in data science and machine learning. And here we are thinking about if you have lots of variation in um, something you're trying to predict, the way that you evaluate model performance is how much of that variation that's left unexplained can be removed by tweaking a good model. So, um, you know, how do we optimize a model for good re um, performance? Uh, whereas, whereas scientists think of how much area, uh, how much variance is explained by variables. Data scientists tend to think of um, if there's, they tend to evaluate the unexplained variance. So the residual variance, and if there's a lot of that, it's not a good model. <laughs> so it, it's it you can actually uh, compare these directly, these approaches directly, but it's a different philosophical mindset, which is really interesting. How do you ensure that the model you're building will generalize to unseen data? This is um, a, again a fascinating, deep question, which I just want to pose and let you think about. As scientists, we typically don't do that. We typically don't do it at all. We imply in a philosophical framework that it is generalizable, but we never test it. 
And so uh, in the real world with data science, uh, as opposed to traditional scientific inquiry with experiments, um, we, we challenge the machine learning model with new novel data that wasn't used to create the model in the first place. Uh, and there are lots of versions and flavors of this, but that's basically the way. We, uh, we, we test it in a, we have a, a lot of little tools in the toolbox to, uh, to try to make sure our model is generalizable. And, and then explicitly, ultimately, we do test it on new data, novel data. Finally, uh, how can you estimate how well your model is likely to perform on new data? Again, there's a lot to this question, and there are lots of little tools which we can't cover today, but one of it is to chop your data up into lots of littler data sets and leave a little bit out each time and compare all the best models from the um, data set with the little chopped out left out bit and use that in an iterative fashion to test to novel data. So you test a set of novel models with just part of your data to some that's left out. Um, that's one way, but there are other ways too. We'll, we'll do one of those ways today. Um, all right, um, I haven't, I think I've mentioned an introduction to statistical learning a number of times. Uh, it's it's a modern classic textbook. It's widely, it's very famous. It's um, got four authors, and uh, two of the authors are very old, famous statisticians who would come up in the top five, or definitely in the top ten, but probably the top five machine learning statisticians ever. The book Introduction Introduction to Statistical Learning has just come out with its second edition, um, which is it, it already is um, is a bestseller, even though you can't buy a hard copy yet. Um, the best thing about it is that uh, it's it's such a great, widely used resource that um, that uh, the authors are academics and they've released the text for free. So you can download the new edition, even though you can't buy it quite yet, not in Britain anyway. Um, you can download the PDF for free. I think this is a link to the general website, and um, some of the ideas here are in um, section 2.1 of chapter 2 of their book, um, the, first, the first edition. But I think that it'll probably be the same section in the second edition. And then there's a little video if you want to watch some more stuff on this. OK, let's go over to the coding. I'm going to put back full cam for a sec. I think today I'm going to do something a little bit different. And rather than doing collab, I did give a collab link. Um, but rather than faffing with the data, I didn't quite have a chance to get the link set up. And rather than trying to do that in front of you so that we don't run over time too bad, I think I'm just going to run the um, mine out of Anaconda today. So uh, I've opened Anaconda. I guess I can show the whole process here. Let me um, share my browser view. And uh, I've just opened my Anaconda installation. And you can use Jupyter, no Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab. But um, I, I fancy Jupyter Lab. It's my favorite one. And it just opens up a, um, a Jupyter Lab. And uh, I think this is open to the to the correct directory. It looks like it is. Um, I think the first time that you use Jupyter Lab, let me see if I can get a better view on this. Maybe this this view is a little bit better. I think that the first time that you start using um, Python locally on your local computer and um, using um, Anaconda. It's the easiest way, uh, definitely for non scientists, probably for computer scientists as well. It's it's very popular. Um, but when you first start using it, it's a little awkward. And uh, one of the awkward things is that by default, uh, at least on Windows and, and Linux, and I'm sure there's a version of this in Macs, if you have more than one hard drive, um, it picks a default hard drive, and you have to 
go to the config file to manually fix that. So, I mean, this is a great tool and it makes your life a lot easier, but it, these tools are a little bit, there's a little bit more difficulty in setting it up and using it powerfully compared to say, plain old R Studio. All right, so um, this tutorial should walk you through the uh, machine learning concept. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna, some of this is review from previous things we've done in the first few meetings here. So uh, we're gonna review how to, uh, we're, we're, I'm not actually going to review it, I'm just going to do it, but it is things we've done before. We're gonna use the pandas library to read data into Python. We're gonna use Seaborn to, um, to um, uh, just visualize the data. Zhi Jing asked about making pair plots and I've got a little micro example of pair plots in here today for you, Zhi. You can have a look and there's some code in here. You should try this first and then play around with it. Uh, so hopefully that's interesting to you. Um, we're gonna look at the ML uh, machine learning context for linear regression, just how it works. It's very different than as a scientist, so this will be different. I've intentionally not tried to, you know, all spell it out. So I just want to get through this, and I'm going to go through pretty quick because I don't have enough time to go very much over today myself, and I don't like to get in the habit of going over. What we're going to do is we're going to train and interpret a linear um, regression model using that scikit-learn package that we talked about before. And we're going to talk about how to evaluate regression problems from machine learning. Again, very different than the way scientists, but I did spell this out in a way that I hope uh, you appreciate and is helpful and clear. And then um, we'll also go through a little bit of model selection. Uh, ecologists or scientists might, we might say model selection is a process, process of comparing competing models. Um, and so we'll look a little bit about how a data scientist might do that today too. All right, so I went over the types of supervised learning um, and you know here we're using um, regression so uh, uh, as opposed to classification the example I gave in the little talk was classification but you know you could you could divide the types of supervised learning broadly into either classification or regression and you know just pointing out that I'm using regression here all right so um, well reading in data using pandas. Um, pandas is already installed in Colab, I believe. You just have to um, import pandas as PD. We've done that before. And um, now I've got my data set up local in this data file. Uh, I've got it available on the um, on the uh, a link on the Happy Group web page so you can download it and set it into this or you can use the url if you wish um but i'm just going to lead it in local and we have done this before in previous meetings but uh, i've given some uh, links here too if you want to get serious about this stuff you'll you'll need to do some work beyond these meetings but um let's just read it in and what this does is it's read in with pandas read underscore CSV, and we've assigned it to a data object called data. And then I've used the head attribute of the pandas data object to display the first few lines of data. And so for some reason, there's a weird little thing going on here, but, um, but uh, we have uh, data on TV, data on radio, data on newspaper and data on sales. I hope I haven't messed up this thing because I, I did some editing right before we got on. So <laughs> we'll see in just a moment, but I think it'll be okay. I think this was an index on my CSV is why it's formatting different. And I, I deleted the index because I thought it might be confusing for people, but I may have messed myself up. And we'll, we'll see shortly whether that's the case. Um, and we can likewise use the tail attribute the tail function so data dot tail with the brackets should display the last um, few rows of data and it does and uh, we can see how many um, rows and columns we have and we so we have four columns and uh, we should have 200 rows i believe 
Um, so actually, um, I think we're going to have to do something here. Let's just let's just delete that and see if it does. Yeah, it does better. I, 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 what I did was um, I deleted the little code that had the index of rows. That's what was messing it up. And um, by deleting that attribute, because I deleted it from the from the um, from the original one. I'm just going to put this in the. If anybody is following along, and they're having trouble with that, um, that's how you read your data, and if it's local. All right. Hopefully that doesn't confuse anybody. So let's look at the head again. Now we do have the four features, and we have the number of rows that have been added in by the read underscore CSV. Okay, this should all work now. And it does. Now it, got, it says it goes down to um, 199, but remember pandas starts with um, with a um, a zero. So that means we should have 200 features. And I'm just going to run this one again, and we should get 200 comma four um, down here because we do indeed have four features. So three, two, one. There we go. Now it's all working. Okay. So what are these features? Um, in the CSV. I didn't I didn't have the personal bandwidth to really spell this out with a data dictionary in tidy data format like I like just for this example. But here this is an advertising data set. And I have to say that this is a weird data set to use for us as natural bioscientists, but um, this is a an absolutely classic data set that is used for regression teaching machine learning and regression and it's got a lot of nice information out about it and it's also the example that um that they use in introduction to statistical learning so I, i've kept it here rather than contriving a new one so the features in this data set the explanatory variables are the features called tv radio and newspaper and this is an advertising data set and it's the um, amount of money spent advertising on those different um, platforms, on TV, on radio, and newspaper in US dollars. Each row is a different market. So for a big company that's selling lots of stuff, um, each one of these would be how much they spent in a particular market. So it might be a different town or a different city. Um, and the response variable here is the sales. So that's the sales in terms of the the number of units of a single product in thousands. OK, so it's each each increment in sales is in the thousands of um, units sold. OK, so what we want to do is we want to evaluate based on how much we spend on TV, radio and newspaper advertising. We want to be able to predict our sales. OK, that's what this data set is all about. This is a typical way that this data started being used by companies, and it was so effective at raising the bottom line that um, that you know it's one of the reasons it's taken off across the world. Advertising was really the big motivation for machine learning. I think that um, in agriculture, I'll just throw this out: agriculture and the environment, and in the sciences in general, um, scientists have not come around yet to leverage the power that even with just simple regression and, and this way of viewing predictive models, we haven't really cracked the case on it yet. So again, opportunities for young people like yourselves. All right, so um, well, what do we know? Well, we know the uh, response variable is continuous. And because the response variable, the thing we want to predict is a continuous variable um, we know this is a regression problem. This is a linear regression problem, but um, it could fit any of the regression kinds of problems. It doesn't have to be a Gaussian one. It could be a generalized linear model with Poisson if it's for counts. Uh, it could be a logistic regression if the dependent variable is ones and zeros, which is, by the way, a kind of classification. Um, we also know that we have 200 observations and that um, each observation is a single market. So uh, it's, it represents quite a lot of data for this kind of data. Now we're going to visualize the data using that um, that Seaborn package. Now the Seaborn 
library. Um, you, you know, you may have to install it if you did it locally. You would install it in Anaconda. You could install it from the command line. I actually think it's it's already these days. It's it comes in the default Python installation when you just install Anaconda. But if you did ever need to install it, it's conda install Seaborn. Um, there are some installation instructions here as well. So we're going to import Seaborn as SNMS, and we're going to execute that matplotlib inline so that we can get some plots. Then um, this is that bit, um, Zhijing, um, with the pair plot function, where you can do pairs. You can read about the pair plot in Seaborn, um, but you can do them in all, in all configurations. But you'll see how I've done this here with these arguments. I'm not going to linger on this because we're running out of time. But uh, this is a nice way to predict, in this case, one um, our dependent variable against each of the other variables. Uh, I've also allowed it, because this is a regression problem, I've allowed the pairs, um, pairs plot um, to uh, draw a regression line and a little bit of a confidence interval about it. A note on this one over here on the, the right-hand side, a really classic thing with all regressions, but it, it's it's got a special interest in machine learning, and, and scientists tend to ignore this. Is uh, notice how out here where we don't have very much data, the error bar gets really big. For scientists, they just kind of ignore that and hope their reviewers don't notice it too bad. Um, but for machine learning and data science, this is a big deal because when you make predictions out here, they tend to add to the error and that, that's why. And so uh, we would probably tend not to ignore it in data science. We'd probably uh, engineer our features to avoid that kind of problem. Just, just saying that in passing. Now, linear regression. This is, um, this is one of the most popular statistical models of all time. It's, it's fast. You do, you actually don't really need to tune a linear regression. It's easy to understand. A lot of other people understand it. So when you're computing, communicating your results, you don't have to fight anybody. Um, and that is in contrast to fancier machine learning models. Um, the cons are that um, compared to some of those fancier ones that aren't as interpretable, like deep learning models, um, regressions not not likely to be as accurate as those other models. So uh, that maybe for complicated problems, you would start with a regression, but then you know use that as the standard to try to beat with a more complicated model. You know, if one does beat it. Okay, so um, another con here is for linear regression. You know, we make some, we have to make some assumptions uh, that have to be true in order for this to be a good model. There has to be a linear relationship for linear regression. For Gaussian linear, for simple linear regression, it's Gaussian. We have to have a Gaussian set of residuals. And finally, um, every one of our data points must be independent to every one, other one of the data points. Okay, so we'll assume we're not going to you know, evaluate those assumptions here. But um, I've gone ahead and I've drawn out the form of the linear regression with this equation. Some of you have seen this before. I know it's a little shocking to see equations, but um, what what how linear regression works is we have some uh, continuous response variable, y, and we estimate um, parameters that describe the model. Um, and the parameters are, um, are we, we typically symbolize them as beta, and uh, the, the x are our features or our variables that we want to use in the regression model. And so what we have is we have one beta that is the, in, the uh, intercept, the grand mean of the intercept of the model. And then we have one beta for each input variable that is the slope of the model. And uh, we can have any number of, um, of predictors or features. So um, that is the standard linear simple regression model. And I guess the uh, thing I didn't put out here is there's also some error, but we'll come to the error at the end. <clears throat> so in our case, our regression model is um, 
our our predicted sales in units of thousands. We want to we want to predict the um, intercept. We're usually, by the way, not really interested in the intercept. We're usually interested in the slope and whether it's different to zero. Because that's what affects the value of a dependent variable relative to a value of one of the predictors. So it's usually the slope and regression that as scientists and as data scientists we're interested in. We're not usually interested in the slope that much. Um, for us then, we want the, uh, we're really interested in the slope for TV sales, the slope for radio sales, and the slope for newspaper sales. Okay, so those are the coefficients that we're gonna, we're gonna do. First thing we need to do is we need to prepare our matrix, you know, and this is a big X um, notation. Big X has a special meaning. I'm not going to break this open because it's beyond what we can do, but but big X here stands for a uh, like a linear algebra representation of all of our features together in a block. And so that's going to be our feature matrix. And then we're going to make a vector for our responses and um, we need to um, we need to uh, make sure that they're in the right format. So when we're going to analyze them in scikit-learn, uh, they are expected to be in the um, the type of of data objects they're expected to be are are that of a NumPy array, both of them. So uh, well, pandas is built on top of NumPy, and so um, we can exploit that, and we can we can just have our data matrix be a pandas data frame and this is be this is the natural way for me to use this it's the way that i have used this stuff whenever i have had the opportunity to use it and it's probably the way that you guys would want to use it too i i would guess so that's exactly what we're doing one we're going to um we're going to create a list of the names of our and this is just a vector of characters for the names that are in our original data set then we're going to um, exploit that feature of character names to extract those columns from our data object and put it into a new column called X. And remember, X is just our, our feature matrix. Um, and, you know, we could do this in just a single line uh, here, exploiting the double um, square bracket matrix. And then let's just kind of have a look at the head of, of that new object. So we've just got a now this literally is just slicing out the matrix of those variables. Pretty pretty boring, but that's the way that it looks in the pandas workflow. And we can look at the type and the shape of that matrix. So this um, the class of the the type. So we've printed out the type here is a is a pandas data frame. That's what we want. And the shape is no surprises. That's good. No surprises is always good. Um, I guess the way that I think about this, you might have heard me uh, say this a lot, is I, I do a lot of, um, and it's good practice to do a lot of testing that uh, when you're manipulating data, that you're sure you understand how the world works. This is a little bit like dueling with the passive aggressive butler in the R world or, or testing that the world really does work in the way that you think it works. So this is just good practice. Let's just make sure that we got it right. Then we're going to extract our um, from our original data object our sales data, and we're going to do that into the um, to a vector called y. And um, we could do this in a number of ways um, because this is a pandas data frame. We could exploit the fact that each of the column names are actually features of the data object. So this is two ways just to do the same thing. And then we're just going to look at the first few values of that. Boom. We see that it, we do actually get the type of that. It's a floating point decimal value, so it's a numeric. And let's just let's just double check the type and look at the shape of that. Okay, no surprises. 200 rows, um, just one column, um, and it's a, a panda series, so a numeric pandas value. OK, here comes the new part to everybody. That's just a little bit of setting our features and getting our feature columns um, ready. That's the part that we've done so far. Now, here's the part that's a little bit confusing if you haven't done it before or thought. It's actually very easy to do, but it's a new way of thinking for scientists 
um, who are using traditional statistics. So what we're going to do here is we're going to import a uh, framework from scikit-learn called train test split. And that's where we take our, our data set and we're going to split it into um, a set that we use to train it and then a set that we use to, um, to, to test the accuracy of our model. All right, and the default split uh, is subjective, but uh, maybe it's 75, 25. The, the default without doing anything funny for, uh, for this framework is uh, 75, 25, but it's a bit subjective. You know, nobody, nobody would fuss too much if um, you used 80, 20 or 70, 30. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're, we're taking our features and taking 75% randomly, randomly we're choosing 75% of the rows and we're assigning it to a train data set. And then the, the other ones that we didn't choose are automatically assigned to the test. So we've randomly um, assigned trainer test to a 75-25 ratio. And we've done the same thing for the dependent variable. So let's just do that. No output there. And then let's just print the shape. So our X train and Y train should be um, you know, 150 and 3 for X train. Um, 150 for Y train, um, 50 and 3 for X test, and just 50 for Y. And that's what we get. See what I did there? I think I know the way the world works. <laughs> and then I tested it. So this is a good like pattern to get into. Okay, so now we're going to um, import the linear regression model. We have already looked at this from Scikit-Learn. And we're going to um, set up our regression model. Now, this is something we don't really do in R, but it's part of the workflow that we do here. We call it instantiating the model into a model object. And then um, we're going to uh, take this attribute, this further function called fit on the, on the model object, the model framework. You know, we can think of the instantiation as setting up the model framework that we're going to use. And then we, we present it with the um, training data. This is a very important part. So we're taking 75% of the data we've randomly selected and we're creating a regression fit. Let's see what that does. Okay, so this just gives us a message that something has happened. So now we have to kind of look into it. <coughs> so into our model object now, there should be a fit attribute that's been calculated with our training data, and we can we can interrogate that um, linreg object by printing the linreg object for the attribute the intercept and the attribute coefficient. Let's have a look at that. So, what should we get out of coefficient? If you're following me, how many coefficients should we get? We should get three. Thank the gods, we got three. Again, that pattern of, um, I think I know how the world works and I'm just testing the way the world works. So we have here an intercept and we have a um, slope coefficient for each of the features. And uh, if we just wanted to, um, we could go back and see the order that they came in, but that's a little, um, that's a little, um, reckless so i'm just going to uh, um, pair the names that we extracted earlier from that feature column with the values that we calculated from the coefficient so there we go so we have our slopes so uh, if we plug these features uh, and the estimates into our regression we have a predictive model now so we have uh, our y should be equal to the intercept, 2.88, plus the um, slope for TV, plus the slope for radio times the radio variable, plus the slope for newspaper times the newspaper variable, the newspaper expenditure. And how do we, how do we interpret these? Uh, oops, didn't mean to do that. <clears throat> how do we interpret the coefficients? Like what, what does it mean that our TV coefficient is you know, 0 0.0466. This is exactly the same uh, way that we would interpret it 
we, we don't often interpret it this way, but you know, <clears throat> we, we do sometimes interpret it this way as scientists. That means for <clears throat> a given amount of, uh, of spending, this is the one for TV. For newspaper, it's uh, it's this amount. For a given amount of radio and newspaper ad spending, uh, one unit increase in TV ad spending is associated with a 0 0.466 unit increase in sales. Uh, and if we want to translate that into things we actually measured, if we spend an extra thousand pound, a thousand dollars, sorry, on TV ads. It's uh, associated with an increase of uh, 46.6 items. See what we did there? Because Y is in units of 1,000. So it takes a while to think about this, but um, this is a way to interpret specifically this data set. And some notes here. This is a statement of association, not causation. We haven't done an experiment, just collected some data. Even though we've used regression and we usually say, correlation is not causation. Well, neither is regression, unless you've done an experiment. We have not done an experiment here. And th this is an important thing to keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> and it's easy to have sloppy language, but um, well, we want to keep that in mind. Also, if there's an increase um, in TV ad spending, and if that were associated with a decrease in sales, um, we would see that our coefficients would be negative. Now, none of them are negative. They're all, they're all positive. Some of them are pretty close to zero. So uh, how do we make predictions? Well, um, remember our linear regression object, there's a predict attribute. And um, here we plug in our uh, test data set, the test portion of our data set, using that predict attribute on our linear regression object. And we're going to dump that into a new variable we call Y prediction. Not Y test. We've made Y test, but we haven't uh, tested that yet. So let's just run this. And uh, we're, we've run over by 15 minutes, but I just want to finish this real quick. I'm going to go pretty fast. So uh, I want to finish within the next five minutes. Um, Here's how we here's how we um, we evaluate metrics. Just a simple example here is uh, what if we um, took the true values of something we me measured in our in our um, our test data set for our dependent variable, and we we compared it to some predicted values that we got from a framework like this. And let's just say we got numbers that looked like this. So our predictions in this case were pretty close and exactly on for some of them and pretty close for the others. Well, we have we have basically three different ways that we use to evaluate the performance of these models. One is mean absolute error. The equation for that is basically the sum of the absolute differences between our observed test values and our predicted values. Okay, the, and these little pipes mean it's the absolute difference, so all positive values. And we sum all of those up and we divide by the total number of observations. So I wanted to give this simple example because you know we can literally show all the calculations to do this. So we can calculate the mean absolute error by hand. And these are the differences. We sum them up and we divide it by four total differences. And um, we can actually, um, there's a little output framework that's traditional to use with a real full speed one where we, um, we calculate the uh, mean absolute error as an attribute of metrics for it. And we're just gonna print it out. Oops, what have we, what have we missed here? True is not defined. Did I miss something somewhere? What did I miss? Oh, yes, I did. Boom. There we go. Ah, there we go. So our mean absolute error is just a it's just a metric is um, is uh, 10. 
Th this we would use, and I'll show you a, a second how we would use it when we're comparing models. But um, our second measure is the mean squared error, MSE. This is one of the normal things we get in linear models out of regression and in ANOVA. Old-fashioned ANOVA tables would go ahead and print this out. We've run out of the habit of doing that in traditional statistics. So what this is, is the, um, the, um, the squared error of the observe of the real values minus our predicted values squared that makes them positive summed and divided by the total number so here i've just done that again manually it's the same numbers all raised to the power of two note the little syntax for that in python it's a little bit different than r and then we have the mean squared error attribute in the metrics um, package so for um, for that example, those are 150. And then finally, the kind of ultimate measure is the uh, root mean squared error, which uh, just takes the square root of the mean squared error. And so you can see how that's done. I'm just going to print these out. And remember, we want to reduce the uh, leftover error. So the best model um, has less error. So if we have zero error by any of these measures, you know, it's a perfect model. I'd actually be very suspicious of that. What we actually do is we compare the amount of residual error based on competing models. And that's how we tune and choose the best model. So we can compare these metrics um, for our sales prediction. So we have our, um, our, remember we set aside our test data set of our predicted values and we made our predictions earlier. So let's see what it is. So in this case, our root mean squared error, or it's our mean squared error. Um, it's a square root. Yeah, we did do square root. It, this is our root mean squared error is uh, 1.4. And the last thing that I'll say is for feature selection. So um, what we might do is we, we might ask if newspaper, if you remember, um, newspaper, if we go up and kind of look at the um, the um, the slope, newspaper had a very small slope. So newspaper only had a slope of 0 0.003. Um, so if we go down here, and what if we made a new set of feature columns with just TV and radio and we dumped newspaper, we made a new X data frame, we made um, a new sales feature we split it all again we fit our train for our new model the dumps newspaper we make our prediction and we calculate the root mean square error for our new model um, if rmse is the same it doesn't matter if newspaper is in there uh, if the root mean square error is higher it means that uh, that newspaper needs to be in there to improve the predictions. And if it's lower, that means it's even the model's worse with the newspaper in there. So let's see. Well, um, the the root mean square error is a little bit lower. Remember, it's 1.40, but it's about the same. But it is absolutely a little bit lower. Um, so the the lower the error is is better. Um, this says unlikely, but it it should say say may be likely. <laughs> a B that it's useful, but maybe not. So this is a bit of subjectivity um, in interpreting it. But that is the whole process. That is one whole no no punches pulled in one hour machine learning evaluation of a regression model. Um, I guess if you want to go on that uh, you could read chapter three in that statistical learning book and there are some videos that those guys did or you could go to um, my own, you know, if anybody's interested and in, I have a whole course the in statistical learning for the data science MSC. Audily, I see you joined. You're you, uh, I've, I've seen you in a few of these, and Audely was a student in there and took that class. And I hope the trail hasn't gone cold. I hope this uh, can refresh your memory, Audely. 
And I know that you might be using this kind of tool in your job now. Um, here's something else on uh, linear regression from a data science perspective, and um, there's some stuff on pandas and Seaborn too. That's all I've got, guys. We're over time massively, but uh, thank you for coming. We're taking a couple of weeks off. I I sort of myself thought that I'm going to take some um, couple of weeks off and not not organize the next few weeks, so you guys can take some time off too from these. Um, and I was planning to come back the first week of September, but uh, I know on the 3rd of September that, uh, this, this may be interesting to Joseph. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't managed to tell him this either, but I can't remember if you were on those emails, but I think on the Friday, um, of September the 3rd, I think that, uh, we're going to be counting potatoes in the field with Cirque or at least I think we may. So uh, I've, I've gone ahead and scheduled for the following week. So it'll be three weeks and I'll see you guys then. Um, when this recording comes down, I'll go ahead and put the recordings up. Uh, I know Matt Butler said that he wanted to come today and he couldn't. So most of the recording will be up for him. Joe, I'll try to send an informational email. I've got lots of emails to answer to you. But otherwise, have a good couple of weeks. If I don't see you, I will see you on Wednesday in two weeks on the R meeting for those of you guys that come to that. And hey, have a great weekend. I'll see you later. Pleasure, guys. I'll see you later. <laughs>